Good to be in the house of the Lord with you. Let's give him praise. Thank God love you for coming out tonight. Thank you guys that are tuned in with us here tonight. So good to be with you in Bible study. Got our special guest with us here tonight. I don't know if you remember Kevin Sapp or not. Some of you may remember Kevin. Uh, he was truck driver that passed through here quite a while back. And every chance he'd give, he would always stop through. It's been a while since he's, since he's been here. And I think the first time he came around to say, Yep. And he thought, what in the world have I got into? This <laughs> but then he said he got such a blessing, he had never been blessed like that. So <laughs> he's been back every chance he gets. So Rand was going to say to him again tonight. But we're going to go ahead and get started. And I got some prayer requests for you. Uh, remember Pastor Hilton Dollar over at Pax Pastor Dan? He's having to do dialysis. And just pray that God would. Touch him and heal him and get him through this kidney, kidney failure stuff so that he can get back to, to doing what he loves to do, which is pastoring. And, and I know that, that God's got a plan for him, so we're just we're just praying for him. And pray for the church. I know it's hard on the church as well. So I just, I just want to lift them all up in prayer tonight. Remember Ashlyn Duncan. You, you remember Randall's grandchildren. Ashlyn and her brother, and Ashlyn has to go to Richmond to have a checkup on her legs. Uh, you know, she, she has difficulty, but she's done it great. So she's going for a checkup, so we're just going to pray everything's all right with Ashlyn. And Marshall Humwick, Humwick, that is Dorcas's nephew. He's 27. He's got EMS, I think Brad said, or EMD. MD. So we want to pray for him tonight. Lift him up in prayer. And if you got prayer requests, that lifted hand this evening. And maybe those that you would like to, to speak of. I think he's, is it tomorrow or Friday? He starts his chemo. Okay. Then Brother James, his chemo treatment. <clears throat> pray for Tom and Georgia Jackson. I stopped by up there today and this little had communion with them and Vanessa and Rick and their three-year-old grandson, Sebastian. And he took communion with us, and when it was over, he said, thank you for the red apple juice and the cracker. <laughs> I said, you were well, Sebastian. So they were never too young to get them off on the right track. So, but just remember, Tom and George, and George is doing well, but she still can't walk any distance. Her legs just don't, don't support her. So pray for both of them. Anybody else that you yes. want? Yeah, Marie. Remember Dorothy Krieger, you know, Travis Krieger, her son, died of COVID. Oh, goodness. <clears throat> Heard a lot of that lately. Just remember Dorothy and, and that family. How's, how's Betty doing? Right. And everything else committed. You know. All right. She is doing a little better. And that's Betty Clark. You know, we, we pray for her. Your sister-in-law. We pray for her quite a bit. So keep, uh, keep her in your prayers. Speaking of the weather, you know, as you mentioned, don't know what's going to happen Sunday, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But <clears throat> just make sure I got your number on the phone like this. Uh, Channel 7 broadcasting if you have it on 7. I'm still still able to hook up with them. I don't know about Channel 10. They've changed their system. So I don't know if I can get into Channel 10 or not. But still, I call everybody and it's on Facebook. And so I'll, I'll try to let all of you know if, if we're not going to have service. If, you know, if it seems the snow is going to come in or whatever, we'll, we'll just have to see. We'll, we'll just play that by ear. But as of right now, we will have service. Somebody else. All right, let's go to John and uh, Kevin. Uh, my wife, Brenda. Okay. She tested positive Monday. Okay. She's she's doing very well. The doctor's been very aggressive with her treatment. Okay. She's doing very well, but 
That's yeah. a concern. Yeah. Real Especially sad. when I'm not home. You know. Absolutely, buddy. Absolutely. So you were really sad. Kevin's wife. All right. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we come tonight in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Just thank you, Father, that we have the opportunity to come together to be in your house tonight. Now, Lord, these that we have called out here by name, Ashton and Marshall and Pastor Hilton Dollar and uh, Brother Bo Lash, we just pray, and Betty Clark and Brenda, Kevin's wife tonight, and Dorothy Krieger, and the loss of her son and that family. Father, we lift all of them up to you. We realize there are those that, that we haven't called out here by name, but they're on our hearts. And Father, I just ask that, that you minister as only you can by way of your Holy Spirit. So now, Father, as we enter into our worship service here tonight, as we will worship in song and then in our giving, and we're going to our Bible study. As always, Holy Spirit, I pray you just have your way among us. In your name, Jesus, we say it by faith. And all the saints would say we love the Lord. Amen. 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 Brother Randall is going to come and sing. And to help him out, I will take up the altar. Cecil is going to get it. Well, <laughs> I don't know. If God wants to, wants to work, man. Ask a blessing on the altar. You, Heavenly Father, we just thank you, dear Jesus. Be enabled to come and worship you, Lord. Giving us another good day. Giving us health, and Lord. Just be with each and every one. Be with all the children. Be with all the lost, all the sick. Be with Pastor Mike, give us a good word. Yes, Lord. What you want us to hear, Lord. Teach us your way, Lord. Lord, we just thank you and give, give you all the praise and all the glory, Lord. Lord, we bless you over this offering, Lord. Bless the ones that give, bless them, Lord. The ones that don't have, bless them too, Lord. Each and every one is your child, Lord. Lord, you just take care of your children, Lord. And we'll do what we can do to be pleasing unto you. Yes, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love that pretty man. He's a prayer warrior.
Myself, boy, the talent is poor around here <laughs> until suddenly it dawned on me his condition. And I was blessed beyond any blessing in a song I've ever had. I love you. I love you. I mean, I would be embarrassed. You want to be honest? I'd be embarrassed. Every one of you would be embarrassed, right? Yeah. yeah whenever, whenever you can, when you can take what you don't have and give it anyhow. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I need. No, that's all right, honey. That's exactly. That's exactly what it's about. You're fixing to take a, a moment and study a lesson about two people that had some property and wanted the church. To think they were more than they were. And I ain't using what I got. <laughs> I love that guy. Oh, no, when Brother Randall told me he, he had won the same. I said, hey, buddy, anything you do for the Lord, that, that's what it's about. If, if the motivation is right, and Randall's is, and it's sincere, then God will always make it work. Brother Ed Maybrick, he, he may be watching here. Ed testified to me pretty much as you did. And Ed said that he had a, has a speech impediment. And <clears throat> he said he, he's very sensitive about that. And the first time he came to this church, Randall sang that morning. And he said, when, when we introduced Randall, Randall sang, he said uh, he knew right then he had found the right church because he said these folk don't look at don't look at who what you can do but they look at who you are and he said that's why he's a part of this church today so God knows what he's doing God knows yeah. what he's doing so yeah yeah like you said I I, I don't see and, and I can hear and man I can't hear he sings. So I praise God for him. Amen. One of these days he's going to say it and he will be able to hear from his dad. Right. The Lord, Amen. The Lord's going, going to bring it out for him. Uh, all right. <clears throat> I have printed out the wrong lesson. You might know. <laughs> well, here we go. So I have no idea. I have no idea what it's going to say to you. No, I'm just, I'm just messing with you. I've got the right one if I can just find it here. <laughs> if, if I put it in the Bible, if I put it in the Bible, now if I didn't put it in the Bible, we might be, we might actually be in trouble. I might have printed out the wrong one. It ain't, it ain't looking good right now. <laughs> I think I've got it back there. So, <clears throat> well, I tell you what, I'll just wing it. We can do that because I remember what I wrote down in my notes. That you guys will just have to help me out here on, on the questions. Let me, let me get a questionnaire sheet. Let me, get a let me, let me borrow yours here. I <laughs> think we'll know which way to go on. When, when I printed that thing out, I printed it online and printed out Sunday sermon, unless you want to hear that again. But I don't think so. We're going to go, we're going to go with 
what we what we've got here. All right, we're in week 13, and we're in chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 1 through 11. And then we'll go back. And we'll actually, I'm not going to go back and go through this one verse by verse, because like I had told you before, uh, the way that Luke has wrote this book, uh, a lot of it is narrative. And there's not a lot of theology in each particular verse, whereas it does happen that way in some of the other books, that verse by verse contains a lot of theology. But in this particular case tonight, what we have here, uh, this story that Luke shares with us about these two people, as Kevin has said, is a narrative. So rather than do verse by verse, we're just going to look at the whole thing. We're, we're going to take the whole event in context. So chapter 5, starting at verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias was of Pharaoh, his wife sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds. And his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part of it, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard him sing. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. And Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried her out, buried her beside her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Wow, can you imagine? Can you imagine? Father, we thank you tonight again that we have an opportunity to study this word. So I pray, Holy Spirit, as I always do, that you lead us into this text, that we might see that which we need to know to be better disciples and even yet better evangelists. Father, I realize nothing is by coincidence, even when it comes to printing out the wrong lesson, because you know how things work. And I believe you can make this happen the way that you would have it happen. So I just trust in you fully and completely. So guide us and direct us as we study together. In your name, Jesus, we pray. And all the saints would say we love you, Lord. Amen. 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 And amen. amen. I guess that's what, what Paul meant when he told Timothy, be ready in season and out of season. Because sometimes you might print off the wrong notes. And you, <laughs> you just have to go what you do. But that, that that's why I thank God that, that I don't just download that stuff and have to read it off, because if you do, you're in trouble. Anyway, let's look at what's on your notes tonight. <clears throat> there at the top is the same paragraph that I had, except a change in the middle of it. The church has been growing since Pentecost, with more people joining the ranks. Now, after they committed themselves to God, they committed themselves to one another. Material possessions no longer divided them socially. Rather, many of them showed that the welfare of their fellow brothers and sisters was more important than wealth. This event shows us how serious God is about retaining honesty and transparency, transparency among believers and leaders. Let me read that last line again. This event shows us how serious God is 
about retaining honesty and transparency among believers and leaders. Isn't that what we're lacking today in the overall church? Isn't there a lot of deception going on all around us? Sure it is. Sure it is. That's why I told you when we got into this book, you would see you would see how it began and you would see where we had ended up. All right, let, let's just talk about this as, as an event, not necessarily as line upon line. So I'll go to your question sheet and then we can discuss things that we need to as far as that goes. Number one, first of all, the issue was not with the amount of money that they kept back or the amount of money that they gave, but it was because of the couple's intent to deceive those who were, who were there in the church. The problem was because of the couple's intent. It wasn't an accident. It was planned. They intended to deceive the apostles and the church. Do we feel any more than here? Why don't you answer? <laughs> they intended they intended to deceive them. That that was the problem with the whole thing. Where if, if you look at it from the standpoint of, of what they did, and you think, well, it's about money and it's a fact that they had cheated God. No. No, listen, <clears throat> I, I know that God had said in Malachi, I'm pretty sure it's in Malachi that he said, how have you robbed me? You have robbed me because of your tithes and, and not giving and things along that line. And that's true. But when, when we don't give unto God, when we don't do what we should do in regards to giving unto God, we're not cheating God. We're cheating ourselves, actually, because it's all his to begin with. Uh, all of it belongs to him. And see, these, these first believers there in chapter 4, I should have just read chapter 4 and went right into 5 because in chapter 4 we learned that they all came together. They were all of one accord. In fact, <clears throat> it finishes up here in verse 31 of chapter 4. When they prayed, the place where they assembled together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke that word of God with boldness. And it was simply because after they had been persecuted by the government instead of separating, they all came back together. They all came together as a group of believers. And they did that because they had love for one another, didn't they? And, and they valued that relationship that they had with each other and with God more than the relationship they had with what they owned as a position. They actually came to look at their possessions as nothing more than what God had given them to be shared among those who were not as blessed as they are. So they understood that concept that it was not really theirs. It was really God's to begin with. So when Barnabas, the guy that set the, the, guy that set the tone for it, <clears throat> it says here in verse 36 and 37, chapter 4, and Joseph, who was also, or Joseph, also named Barnabas by the apostles. It was translated son of encouragement. We talked about that. He was a Levite, a Jew from Cyprus. Having land sold it, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And we said he got the name the encourager because of what he did. He did that and that encouraged the rest of them to do that. So Ananias and Sapphira fall right into that group. So there was nothing different about what they did other than their intent, their intent to deceive the apostles. And that's how that's how the problem came into play. Now number two, it seems that God dealt with them harshly. However, the law was specific concerning business. The law is specific concerning business. Which scripture tells us this? I don't know. Leviticus 19 and 11. Leviticus chapter 19 and 11. Flip over there to that. 
Flip over to Leviticus 19 and 11. And see, we think, well, the law has nothing to do with it. Well, yes, it does. Yes, it does. <coughs> Leviticus 19 and 11 says, You shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. Leviticus 19 and 11. What did Jesus have to say? about the law. That's exactly right. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy or to do away with the law, but I came to fulfill the law. You find that in Matthew 5 and 17. So, you put that together with what has happened here, and you say, well, now we're talking about a New Testament church. How does the Old Testament law apply? Because Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law. I didn't come to destroy the law. So if the law had said that you shall not deal falsely, or you shall not steal, or you should not deal untruthfully with your brethren, then why would Jesus not do that? If that's what the law had commanded, and Jesus said, I'm here to fulfill that law. And that's what they were doing. They were deceiving. They were lying to, to their brethren. They were lying, not only to them, but unto God, weren't they? About what they what they had sold the land for, how much it had, how much it had brought on the market, and then how much they had handed off to the disciples. Now, in verse 4, we're going to James's epistle here. And what does James tell us that happens when our motive turns into sin. That's why I spoke about what Randall does, his motive for doing what he does. His sincerity in doing what he does. What did James, James in his epistle, I think it's, I think it may be James 4, I'm not sure. I'm going to turn over here and see if I find it for you quickly. But I think it's in James 4 is where it comes from. Or maybe not, it may be similar. Let me, let me check it right Nick. here. <clears throat> yeah, I'm wrong. It's James. It's in the first chapter of James. James 1 and 15. James chapter 1 and verse 15. Here's what James says. <clears throat> then, when desire has conceived, it does what? Gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, does what? Ain't that what happened to Adonai since the fear? Didn't they intend to deceive? The desire was, was to deceive the church, so it gave birth to the sin. And not only was it a sin to do that, but they carried through with it. And then James said, when sin is full grown, it brings forth death. And it does. James just simply says it's one thing to, to think about sin. It's one thing to think about doing it. Because once it's conceived, once the temptation is there, and once you think about it, then if, that, if it gives birth to sin, that's why it's important that, that when the thought comes, or the temptation comes, that you deal with it then. Because if you discuss it and you think about it and it conceives within your mind and it becomes something you, you're deciding you're going to do, then the action which is carried out because of what you think you're going to do and you want to do that, when you carry out that action, then that becomes the sin itself. And, and the temptation is not a sin, but committing that which you shouldn't do is the sin. And then James simply said, when sin is full grown, when it's full grown, it leads to death. So that, that tells me that there, you know, if, if you sin a little bit, there's a good chance that you're going to sin a whole lot. If it's all right, if one, if one sin's okay, then why, why isn't another one okay? 
I mean, how could you how could you get past that if, if it's already there and you do it? So I'm going through these quick, and then we'll go back and discuss this whole this whole again. So that's what James tells us in number four. There, he says that sin brings forth death. That's what your answer is. Now, number five, we learn that it was the devil that inspired these two to do what they did. And Jesus explains it to us in, I think it's John chapter 8. <clears throat> I think it's John chapter 8 and verse 44. That's where I think I got that from. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. John 8 and 44. give you a chance to get over there. Now we know the devil inspired it because what did Peter say to them? Why does Satan put this in your heart? Isn't that what he said to them? That's what he said. Why does Satan put this in your heart? Look what Jesus said about that. John chapter 8 verse 44. He told these Pharisees, he said, you are your father who? You are your father the devil. And the desires of your father, you want to do. How about that? He was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand in the truth, because what? There is no truth in him. No truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. Yeah. He, he, he conceives it. <clears throat> For he is a liar. He's the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you'll not believe me. So which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Here's the key. He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Hmm. Think about that for a minute. Satan put that into their heart to deceive them. But, but now let, let me tell you from, from just from experience, maybe. You know, I, I often thought when I would hear people talk about, about temptation, and, you know, and, and like Otis on Andy Griffith, if you remember where Andy runs into him and that's the episode she you know, throw the old guy off his land and you know, you know, Otis or Anthony told me that he needed to go to church more. You know that episode. It was pretty funny. But she met Otis coming out and she was coming in. <clears throat> and she said, Otis, she didn't do it, you know. And he said, Otis says, Well, <laughs> he said, I saw temptation coming, but it saw me first. <laughs> I thought. Yeah, sort of like what Caleb told Glenda one time in children's church when he got in trouble. She said, Caleb, honey, <clears throat> do, do you just look for trouble or does it somehow just come around? He said, it always finds me. He said, trouble always finds Caleb. It's just, so I often thought about the temptation part as being you're going through life and everything is just working fine and just out of the blue this happens to you and it comes up on you and it's almost... It's almost just like Adam said in the garden when God said, if you ate of the tree, I told you not to. Instead of Adam saying, you know, Lord, I did, Adam said, that woman you gave. <clears throat> so instead of acknowledging what he did, he, he passed it off and said, well, there's a reason for me doing what I did. So we often think about that, but I am convinced now, as a pastor, I am convinced that it begins, as James says, we are drawn away by our own desires, and then we are enticed. And that's why Paul warned not to give place to the devil in our thinking. Because <laughs> if at some point we think about this, then the devil finds an opportunity that if this is the way we're thinking, then he can just help us in that area then he can just come right in behind that or on top of that and be able to take it a step further. I think that was the thing with Judas. When, when I read uh, 
the Jewish virtual library there online out of Israel. When, when I read what the Orthodox Jews have to think about Judas, they, they believe because he was the son of perdition, it was orchestrated by God. He had to be the one somebody had to, somebody had to do this to Jesus. And he was the one that was chosen. So they think that he was a victim of circumstance rather than the fact that he made that circumstance. But if you read the scripture closely, you will find where the gospel writers tells us that that he never he never was right on check with what Jesus then was doing because when the woman brought the perfume and broke it, he spoke up and said we could have sold that and give the money to the poor. And then I think it's John that tells us that that wasn't really his his motive. His motive was that they would put the money in the bag because he would take money out of the bag. So there was something about him before it came to the betrayal that Satan was able to see and reveal. And perhaps at that, at that time in his life, then Satan was able to take advantage of that and move in on him and tell him, Jesus is not really the Messiah. This guy is a hoax. He's a con man. And you need to put a stop to him. Could have very well happened. Scripture doesn't say that. All we know for sure is he betrayed him. And he was the son of perdition. But with Ananias and Sapphira as doing what they had done, and Satan entered their heart, I don't think for one minute that they was planning to give all the money to the church. I think that they had probably debated how much they were going to give them, how much they were going to keep. And I think Satan moved in on that. And he said, well, you don't have to tell anybody. <laughs> you know, you, you, just, you just keep it and just let them think that you're giving it all. You know, Peter Peter qualified it when he told them, when he told Ananias, he said, look, it belonged to you. I mean, it was your possession. You were the one who makes the decision what to do with it. If you had said, I'm going to keep 40% of it and give 60 to the church, or I'm going to keep 60% and give 40 to the church, Peter said, that's your decision. There, there was nothing wrong with making that decision. But, if you give the 60% or the 40% to the church and then tell the church, this is what I got for it. This is all of it. This is a complete amount. That's where the problem came into play. That's, that's what the sin was about what they did. So we understand that where they came from. Now, I read several articles in the past few days a debate as to whether or not Ananias and Sapphira were actually part of the community and just went out and did this and they seem to think that, that they were believers. They, they seem to think they were part of the believers. I don't. I don't think they were part of the community. I think they saw what was going on in the community that this is me. I mean, this is not scripture. But I think they saw what was going on in the community and they wanted to be a part of that community and they did it their way. Uh, I think they said, this is what we're going to do to become a part of who they are. And I think that's what the problem was. I think if they had been a part of the community, I don't think they would have ever went as far to do that. That goes along with when I talk about head saved and heart saved. And it's a difference in being born again and thinking that you're born again. It's the fact of saying, well, I am so that for Christ. I, I am doing what God wants me to do. Or just saying, well, I'm going to do what I want to do, but I'm going to follow God too. See, see what I'm saying? And the personal individual life, that's up to you. But when it comes to the church in general, God's not going to put up with that. Not in his church. It, it's not because the church is built upon what? Righteousness. It's built upon truth, isn't it? It's built upon righteousness. So if, if they were to lie about one thing, how do you know they're not lying about other things? If they lie about this, how do you know they're not going to lie about that? So God took Barney Bob's advice and nipped it in the bud. He stopped it before it started. Now look at number six. God told the Apostle Peter what had taken place by way of the Holy Spirit. Had God not done that, listen, the apostles 
would not have known. Satan would have found a foothold in the church, and the apostles would have been false apostles. They would have been false apostles. How do you know that? Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2 in one of the letters to the churches. Flip over that. Did you know there was a such thing as false apostles? According to Revelation 2 and 2, there was. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2, Jesus said to the loveless church, the church of Ephesus, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have what? Tested those who say they are apostles and are not. And have found them liars. So if the apostles had not known what had happened, still doesn't mean it didn't happen. But if God had not revealed it unto them that this was taking place, then there would be no foundation of which to build upon the truth. But God revealed it unto them. Jesus said the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he, he does what? He convicts the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. That's what he does with me. If it's not right, he tells me it's not right. And then it's, at, that, at that moment, it's my decision either to accept that or not. Now, now, whether I accept it's completely up to me, but he's going to tell me what's right and what's not right. And when he told Peter, when Peter brought that, he said, well, was this a special word of knowledge? Or yeah, some kind of gift that God gave him because he's establishing his church. Leaders should be discerning. <laughs> leaders should, should be gifted. Leaders should, leaders should know. It's like the story that, that this guy won the lottery and he called up and he called this one church and the receptionist answered. He said, hey, he said, uh, I'd like to talk, uh, I'd like to talk to the pastor in just a few minutes. He said, I've got some money I want to give. And the lady says, okay. So he talked to the pastor and he said, I just won the lottery. He said, I want to give the church some money. And, and the pastor said, well, I'm sorry, sir, but we're, we're not going to be able to take that. And the guy said, really? And he said, yeah. He said, it, it's the devil's money. I mean, it came from the lottery. It came from gambling. And we're not going to be able, we're not going to, be able to take that. And I said, all right. So he called another church, probably a Pentecostal. <laughs> he called another church. He said, I need to talk to the pastor. The pastor answered the phone. And he said, look, I just won the lottery. He said, I want to give the church a part of these winnings. I want to give them some money. And the pastor said, sure, buddy. Just write us a check. And the guy said, now that's funny. He said, I just talked to another pastor who said he didn't want it because it was the devil's money. And he said, well, it may have been, but he's had it long enough. You need to give it to God. You <laughs> <laughs> just pass it right on and pass it over to us. So if Peter and him had known that Ananias and Sapphira had a lie about that and had not, had not carried through or done anything about that, that lie would have been formed within that church and it would have failed because Jesus said if a house is not built on the rock when the storm comes up against it, it will fall and great will be the fall of that house. So there is, there is nothing deceiving, there is nothing that's hidden, there, there is nothing crooked within the church, the real church. Because if there was, it wouldn't have stood the test of time that it stood since the book of Acts. So, Satan would have found a foothold in the church, and the apostles would have been false apostles, as we see in Revelation 2 and 2, which the church of Ephesus had found that there were such things as false apostles. Now, turn to 1 Corinthians 5, and let's look at verses 6 and 7. Now, see, what you have to understand is that Paul writing these letters if you remember, Paul's the one who persecuted the church. So if there had been any falsity, if there had been any deception or any, any corruption within the church, 
Paul would have had a leg to stand on when he made his accusation against those Christians. But he didn't have a leg to stand on. And when he wrote this letter to the Corinthian church, in, in 1 Corinthians 5, look at verses 6 and 7 here of, of what he, he, he tells him. And he's talking about their glory. He, he's talking about immorality, actually, within the church. And in verse 6, he says, Your glory is not good. Let, let, me just, let me just get on the soapbox for that just a minute. Glorifying sexual immorality is not good. That's just what Paul said. Your glory is not good. Do you not know, here, here's what it goes back to the what we're studying in Acts. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Anybody not any bakers here that knows what that means? I had to look it up when I was studying it. Corinthians because I didn't think. Mary, you're shaking that hand. Tell us what leaven is and what it does. So you, you can't hide it. Remember when Jesus told the parable about the kingdom of heaven, he said the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a lady hid in a loaf of bread. And then what happens? When it gets hot, the whole thing, the whole thing it affects the whole thing, doesn't it? So just a little, a little bit of it affects the whole outcome. Wouldn't that have been the case in the book of Acts if this deception that Ananias and Sapphira was trying to pull off in the church, wouldn't that have been the same thing as Paul was talking about with the sexual immorality? If you let just a little bit of it in, it's going to ruin the whole thing. It's not just going to stay in that one little area to which you think it is. He said, therefore, verse 7, do what? Purge out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump. Ain't that what God did with Ananias and Sapphira? That there was some deception, there was some corruption that was about to enter the church, and God purged it. God said, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And he purged it. Since you truly are unleavened, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. There's the born again thing that Jesus talked about. If you've got a little leaven in that, then it's going to blow up on you. If you haven't purged it all out, then there's enough in there that's going to blow up on you. That's why it can't be the heart, the head saved. It's got to be the heart saved so that when Christ comes in, it's all purged. He cleanses it all. That don't mean that we'll try to get back in there. Remember, Jesus also said that an unclean spirit, when he goes out of the land and he comes back and the place has been swept clean, he hadn't put nothing else in there. He got rid of the old, but he didn't put the new in. Then he said the spirit comes back in there and goes, what, bring seven more with him? So that the end of that, guys, works in the beginning. What, what did Jesus mean by that? It just simply means, you think, well, I need to change my life. I need to get rid of this. I need to get rid of that. I need to get rid of this. And you do that. You get rid of all this stuff, but you don't put Christ in your heart. It ain't going to stay. It's going to come back, and there's going to be more of it because you didn't fill that, that space with Christ. You, you just left it wide open. So, see, you, you, can't, you can't cleanse yourself, can you? You can't do it. It, it doesn't happen. That's why we got to be born again. So Paul wrote in Corinthians that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And that's the, that's the whole part of what's going on here in the book of Acts. <clears throat> in which Ananias and Sapphira were, were killed and he nipped that in the bud so that there would not be any of that corruption that went out through the church. Now, listen, it probably happens a lot. Probably happens all the time. Probably still does happen, but it's not of God that it happens. If this had been let go, then the corruption that was in the church today would be a part of the corruption that was in the church then. But that church was not corrupt. 
It was transparent because everybody knew what happened. See, it says, it says here that everybody, when, when they heard what went on there, everybody heard that. Then fear came upon all those who heard their saying. What, what does that tell you? Did, did it, does it cause you to fear that when you read that? That they lied to God and God killed them on the surface. That's what it looks like. And that's how it is when you read it. Does that scare you at all? For a little bit? I, I mean, does that, does that make you stop and think about how serious God is? Uh, about honesty and transparency? See, see why hypocrisy is such a bad thing? within the church and within people's lives is because it's not it's not honest it, it's just not I mean you, you take this like this like Kevin we, we were back there he told Randall he said don't be offended Randall don't be offended but the first time he told you not to be offended he said the first time I heard you saying I thought what awful sin that's honest an Israelite in whom there is no God <laughs> I mean that's the honest truth that's the first thing you think about when you hear that. But those of us who know Randall, and those of us who know Randall's heart, and those of us who know that Randall was born again, we don't hear that. We hear a disciple worshiping his Lord. That's what we hear. See, see the general public may hear that. Well, well but we understand that, that Randall's Randall's motive is, is not for Randall. What he does, he does for God. And it works. Amen. And it works. That, that's the point. But if this had not happened within the church, if Ananias and Sapphira had been honest and had come forth, we would probably not even be grieving about it. But they didn't. And the fact that they didn't is what caused them to be killed in the first place, that God nipped it right where it was. Because in Christ there is no God. There, there is no sin within Christ. There is no sin in his church. So that's that's how it it was started. That's how it began. So the, the corruption that that you and I see didn't just happen in our day. We're going to see here as we go through this book. We're going to see how it all took hold and how it all took place because, as I have said before, the more people you bring into it, the more problems it's going to be. See, the, the bigger it's going to get. And that's where we are 2,000 years down the road. It's the rule of exponentialism, which means it starts right here at a point, but the further out it goes, the wider, the wider it gets. See, you think, well, those there in that day, great fear came upon all of them. Verse 11, great fear came upon all the church and of all those who heard these things. So you and I see evidence today that there are those who corrupt and they have no fear. They have no fear. A, a little, a half truth, a half truth is a whole lie. I didn't get that off Facebook. You can put it on Facebook. But I didn't get that off Facebook. A half-truth is a whole lie. There, there's no such thing as, as a half-truth. But Satan deals in that. But there is no truth in him. He's the father of it. So when Ananias and Sapphira agreed together, ain't that what Adam and Eve did? You know, you ever thought about what would happen? I just keep thinking, what would happen if Adam had said, you crazy woman? <laughs> Are you crazy? God said not to even touch that tree. That's what she said. Not even touch that tree. Are you crazy? And I don't want nothing to do with you or that apple. You wonder, you wonder what would happen. But it didn't. He said, no. That woman you gave me, she gave me and I ate it. And you that's see where, where we're at today. That's where the blame game started. The blame game started. <laughs> and you and I are still paying the price for it. People are still dying today 
because they agree to go against what God had said to do. And here it is again, the bad guy says, Here, this couple says, We're going to sell this land for a thousand dollars, and we're going to give 400 of it to the church, but we're going to tell them that that's how much we sold it for. And then Peter said, No, you're lying. But you're not lying to Peter, you're not lying to us, you're lying to God, because God owned that land. God knows how much money you got for that land. And God knows that your intent was to lie to everybody else. And that would look bad on God. And he ain't going to put up with it. So he didn't, he didn't put up with it. Questions and comments? Nipped it in the butt. And, and it said, great fear came upon all the church. You know that it did. You know that it did. You think about that for a minute. I mean, it came up on all the church. All of them were there at that day. But word, it didn't take word long to get out about what happened. Hey, did you hear about what happened on that night? Sapir? No! What happened that night? They sold that property over there. They sold lots of fire over there. Give the money to Baker's Chapel. And they told Baker's Chapel, this is every dime of what we sold it for. And Pastor Jim Tadale said, no, it ain't. You're lying to me. You didn't give me all that money. And God struck them dead right there in the church. Boom, there you go. Yeah, I went to the funeral. I know that happened to them. And you think everybody would say, Lord, have mercy. Don't be lying to God. Because he's going, there's no fear today. There's no fear. That's, that's why you don't see as many people coming to Christ as we did at one time, people were afraid. People were afraid of going to hell, Charles. There was a time people feared the judgment of God. That, that's, that's went the way of the majority. Now it's just a belief. Now it's just something you hold to. Now it's just, Oprah Winfrey says, well, that's, that's your way, God. My way is different. There, there's a lot of ways. According to this book, but I still fear this book. I think he does what he said. And, and I think he's about transparency. And I think he's about honesty and not being corrupt. You, you've got to, you just got to say it like it is. And if you don't know, then, then you just don't know. Now, lying is worse than ignorance. It's better off just to say, I don't know the answer than to make up something. I don't pay attention to that cut back there on my desk. I had to give me one time for Christmas. That cut says, if you, if you don't know the answer, ask Dad. And then on the other side of the cut, it says, and if he don't know it, he'll make up something. <laughs> <laughs> that, ain't, that don't go with the Bible. You know, and it might raise the kids. Questions or comments on any of that? Any, any, any of this event that took place? Any, any, Anything you want to add to or ask about it? We're all good on that. If, if something should happen and I die while I'm in church, yeah. would somebody at least tell my wife before you bury me? It's like she always like, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's one thing. She didn't know he was dead. They didn't know that dead dead and buried. Dead and buried before she even knew he was dead. I guess that's where the Irish get, get their blessing from. The Irish blessing, a family of the Irish, the Irish blessing says, may you be in heaven three days before the devil knows you're dead. <laughs> Maybe that's where they get it. <laughs> Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you we had another time together and study into this word and Lord, as, as I have said, we're disciples. We're here to learn about you. We're here to grow in you. So, Lord, I pray that the way of your Holy Spirit, as this word is in our hearts, that there are those out there who, who don't know the things that we know about you, and it is our job as evangelists to tell them and to remind them that we have said that there doesn't seem to be a lot of fear of God, but we all know there's a lot of fear in the world today. There is a lot of discord. There's a lot of distress. There's a lot of fear out here. But it's, it's of the wrong thing. And that fear is of, of your future. But help us. Help us to bring Jesus into their lives. Help us to introduce them to him. 
And then that perfect love that he has will cast out that fear, and they too will know what we know. So we give you all the thanks, and we give you all the praise, and we give you all the glory for everything you do. In your name, Jesus, we pray. And all the saints would say we love you. Amen. Amen. And amen. God bless you. And stay tuned on the Sunday night. And I'll let you know that Sunday.